Hello and welcome to this For Your Consideration video. Now, the uh, more observant of you will notice that behind me I've got this giant screen. It's not a real life screen. It's a capture of my desktop, as a matter of fact, or actually of Photoshop. And um, we're going to be looking at, in today's video, a request that came through from uh, a viewer uh, who asked, how do we do multi-level dungeons? Multi-level. Um, level. <laughs> All right, so don't worry, it's not going to look that bad. So how do we do multi-level dungeons? How do you design them and how do you draw them? Now, don't worry, this is not a video where I'm going to spend 20 years busy drawing uh, out very carefully and uh, very slowly. Uh, I'm just choosing the right pen tool here. It's not a video where I'm going to be drawing out each room with a door and the passage where, don't worry it's not that no we're going to be looking at the idea of how to design the dungeon drawing the rooms and that kind of thing that's entirely up to you and that's something that um you can go through and there are videos on this on this channel as well as to how to do that if you if you really are stuck for inspiration oops <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is the first time I'm doing this live this way without using pen and paper. And of course, the reason for that, well, if you watch the other videos, you will know why. Um, pen and paper, paper does not do so well on um, the uh, video camera here. So we're going to talk about how to design dungeons in such a way that they make sense and that when you're then drawing out the rooms are a lot easier to do. Now, the very first thing that we do, unlike a city, we don't have to worry about ecology. We are shaping the environment or we are building the environment in a dungeon a dungeon case. So what do we have to worry about? Well, in my opinion, there are only two places to start. There's one place with two questions, let's put it that way. Is the dungeon an organic space that has, over time, created a dangerous environment? In other words, was it an ancient temple that has long since been abandoned and that has slowly, over time, accumulated monsters? Or is it a current lair or habitation of someone who would then purposefully put the monsters there? Now, the reason for this is fairly simple. Either... If it's an organic dungeon, we have to work out the ecology of that dungeon. If it's a paid dungeon, in other words, if someone is paying the monsters to be there, we then have a few other things that we need to work out, which is slightly different. There's an economy that we need to build into that dungeon. So those are the two different considerations that we first need to decide upon before we even start. Now, I'm going to do, um, let's say, I'm going to do an organic one today for you. The economic one, the one that's paid for by someone to be there. There are a few different considerations which I'll talk about as we get there. So that's now out of the way. Step two, the kind of dungeon. What kind of dungeon is this? Now we've spoken that this is an organic dungeon that has slowly over time populated itself with monsters and that our heroes are now moving through to try and get to a final goal, final destination. That's also a question that we have to ask. But first, what kind of structure is it going to be? And now we could do the carcass of some great being, or it's a space slug and we're going through the internal intestines of a space slug, or it could be a ruined temple. It could be any number of things. But I think for today, anyway, we're going to focus on a traditional structural dungeon now whether this is an abandoned starship or a space station or whether it is a dungeon in a fantasy world or even if it is a building let's say in the slum areas of a city or a town the ideas that i talk about in this video will apply accordingly replace orc with low life or space alien replace kobold with small low life small alien etc etc and they should still work because the idea is how these things form rather than specifics all right so so we have now got this this idea of a traditional space a traditional dungeon now again this is more from the old days than anything else dungeons generally get smaller as you go down in level 
Now, or up in level, depending. Modern day, we know this is not true. As you go down in basement levels, they don't get smaller. Sometimes they get bigger. As you go higher up the building, they don't get smaller. They usually stay the same size. That's modern day architecture. In the old days, it got smaller at the top because it was less load bearing on the structures below that needed to be done, etc, etc, etc. We're, of course, in a fantasy world or a science fiction world, but we don't really care about those kind of things because we assume they've been handled by magic or science fiction or a combination thereof. So what I'm going to do very roughly, and you will have to forgive me, is I'm going to plot out and I'll, I'll have to check that I can. I don't have two monitors. so I'm going to bounce back and forth. So let's do for lack of a better word, a mine that was dug, that found an ancient temple, and that released an evil, and then the evil was defeated, and now this mine shaft has been populated by creatures, and there's rumors of something living at the bottom of it. All right. So what I like to do is I like to draw a side view first. So I'm going to do that here. So I'm going to zoom in move up to the top left hand corner this is not a photoshop tutorial so uh so what we're going to do is we're going to say right so here is our surface level and then we have our mine shaft which goes down we've got side corridors side levels and you have to you have to decide how big this dungeon is going to be now you can go truly epic and have lots of side levels all right i've got one two three four five six Let's do seven, and then we open out into the big gap. All right, the big gap, which is where the actual temple is. One, two, three, four, five, six. Whoops, my mouse pad slipped. <laughs> seven. All right, and then the last one, eight. Great. Okay, and then there's the top of the mine shop. So. Now, within this mine shaft at the very bottom, we then said there was a temple. So let's uh, build our ziggurat. One, two, three layers or levels of ziggurat, something like that. Um, like that and like that. And they're not going to, it's not a, this is now the important thing. This, I hope you could see that. I really hope you could see that. Let me just, let's just pop in again. If I keep it there, yes, you can see it. All right, good. So what this represents is a side view of the dungeon, and now it allows us to ring fence certain areas in different colors. This is not the layout. This is not a straight shaft down to the ziggurat. That we will work out in a little bit. So I'm going to change colors now. I'm going to change to, let's say, green. I'm going to make a new layer. I'm going to choose a different tool here. OK. So these are the zones that we are going to have. We have that zone. We have, and I'm, I'm literally just, it's probably an easier way of doing this, right? But I'm an, I'm an idiot when it comes to this kind of stuff. So there's a zone, there's a zone. Just choosing random colors here doesn't mean anything. Okay, whether you choose zones or not, it's again your call. It's your dungeon. How you want to do this is entirely up to you. Okay, so we're going to end up with 10 or 11 zones, depending on... Yeah, see, so something funny happened there, but that's okay. That's okay. I, generally speaking, if I've made a mistake, unless it's... A, unless it is hypercritical that the map or whatever is symmetrical. So if it's a starship, say, for example, and it's not organic, then then I'll go back and I'll correct it. But if it's just a dungeon design like this, well, that doesn't matter. Um, now, what I forgot to do, which I should have done, well, I, I don't know if it's going to make sense. Uh, sorry, I'm rambling here, but I should have put up a picture of this is the dungeon that you're going to design at the end of this video, uh, which, of course, you put in backwards because you don't know. Well, I never know what I'm going to design 
before I start, because this is conversation, so it sort of grows and flows as we go, but I, I should have done that. So anyway, who knows what this is going to look like. I'll probably jury rigger solution. All right, there we go. Good, 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 fine. Right, so there are our, no, don't want to save you. There are our layers, and I'm just going to, oops. Uh, would you behave? I'm going to do that. So we can now see our different whatevers. Okay, so now here is the most important thing as far as I'm concerned when it comes to dungeon design like this. Each of these zones represents a different mode style or way in which this dungeon is going to react. We do this so that the dungeon doesn't become the same old, same old, same old. This is a big dungeon. So we have to assume that the players are going to have their characters in here for multiple sessions. This is a good old fashioned dungeon run. It's going to take them many, many hours to move through and clear the area. And there is the potential that they will leave, go back to town and then come back again. And so there is options that we need to, to come up with. This for me helps in terms of guiding the design of the dungeon. We can now look at it and go, all right, the green zone at the very top, the green zone up here, uh, this zone, uh, what layer am I on here? There we go. So the green zone up here, little arrow, that's our entrance area. And that's got to set the tone for the dungeon. Now, obviously, I'm telling you how to do a dungeon, a multi-level dungeon, from a narrative perspective, because it's important for me anyway, that that's, that's how I approach life. So the entrance to the dungeon becomes critically, critically important. And that generally should mirror in some way, shape or form the tone that the dungeon is going to be moving forward. Let me, let me uh, elaborate. So if the dungeon is going to be trap focused riddles pitfalls all those kinds of juicy and wonderful things the entrance should have one or two of those present okay they don't have to be working but the players characters need to find them before they arrive in the actual dungeon itself so in this case, it's an old abandoned mine shaft. So we can imagine that there might be an old wooden structure built above the first pit that sinks into the ground. There's some outlying buildings. And because it's a mine shaft, the one type of trap that we know we're going to have in there is we're going to have rock falls and we're going to have rotten floorboards. And because it's a mine shaft, we're going to have an obligatory mine cart race chase thing. But that's for later. So. We need to establish that we're going to have rock falls and pitfalls and that the players need to be careful. This means that in this green area, we need to have, uh, and I'm, I'm going to type it because that might make life easier, I think, or more legible anyway. We're going to have traps at least, okay, and they could be broken, right? to preempt in the player's mind. Oh, there's, there's floorboards that were covered over with leaves. We didn't see them. When they gave way, we only fell five foot. But at the bottom was some nasty, rusted metalwork and some old pickaxes that were left pointing upwards. That's terrifying. Okay, absolutely terrifying. So this establishes uh, things to come, right? So what is going to be in there? We also need to now, and we started thinking about it, but we didn't, we didn't uh, necessarily finish thinking about it, is what is at the bottom? So what is this golden prize here where I'm going to put a bad X? What is that X? What is there? Is it 
hidden treasure, forgotten treasure, a lost treasure, something that wasn't considered a treasure back then, but is considered a treasure now. What is the MacGuffin that is going to get the party to go to the very bottom of this particular dungeon? And it could be many things. It could be an abducted princess or a prince. It could be a great book. It could be an artifact of power. It could just be cash. It could be the player's personal pocket knife has been stolen and was thrown down the mine shaft and that's where it landed. However, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter too much as to how we're going to design this dungeon, but it is important that we allow the characters to know that it is in there. Because there's nothing worse, especially in a multi-level dungeon, where the players don't feel a sense that, yes, this is the right path, we need to slog through all of this because we will get there eventually. And that is the prize that we're after. So we let us say, for the sake of this argument, it is a rare, rare golden artifact that the players know was hidden by a monk who served in that temple just before the temple was overrun by some unknown factor. Now, it was hidden in plain sight. It was turned into a stone, uh, let's think of something innocuous, water bowl that is rumored to sit in the prelate's old main uh, temple chamber where they conducted their ceremonies. They turned it into a stone bowl. So no one would think it has any value whatsoever and they would leave it alone. But the players know that it is incredibly, incredibly valuable. It's made out of solid platinum and is studded with rubies. And that's where they're going to go. Aha! Now we have some more information. So in the outside, on the outside of this area, the players can also find, and these are notes that you would be taking, the players would also find perhaps um, an old stone statue outside that uh, is holding a small dagger, a stone dagger, and that if they touch the stone dagger, they actually discover that the stone dagger turns into a silver dagger. Again, just hinting that the notes that they got, that the map that they're following is a real map. It has actual value. And that's important. That's important. So again, by plotting out a top view of the dungeon, we can then go, okay, our green zone, I'll draw it up here. All right. Our green zone, then we have, uh, let's say some mountains on the top of it, right? And we've got mountain passes over here as well, because that's important. It's in the mountains. It's mine. Okay. That's, that's what we're going with. That's what we're going with. Uh, over here is swamps because we want our players to come in from the one angle. They, they're they going to find some way to muck it up anyway. So we've got more mountains around here. Da -da 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 -da. Okay. And then the actual mine shaft itself. Uh, I don't know what that's going to look like. Put a wheel on it. Uh, whatever. Okay. So there's the actual mine shaft that they will go into. Okay. We're going to have that statue standing outside. Now, why is it important that you draw this? Well, this is level one, technically, of your dungeon, isn't it? This is the very first step in designing your dungeon. Because if we now look at this and we say, all right, our players arguably are going to come in from, uh, let's say, this way right? Because there's this evil boggy swamp. So they're obviously going to come in through the swamp, however it is that they access it, right? They're going to come in from this way. They're going to go into the mine shaft. They're going to maybe see the statue. Great stuff. However, this also needs to establish some of the monsters that are down there as well. That means we need to think a little bit about the creatures that have moved in here. We know what the creatures are in the general area because, well, we know the general area. It's mountainous, so maybe it's cob it's goblins, it's possibly ogres or orcs. It's all kinds of weird and wonderful things. Maybe it's some undead, maybe it's lizard folk because of the swamp nearby. Uh, all those kind of thoughts should go through your head. However, what is more important is for us to stand back and look at the dungeon once more and realize that to get from this level, from this level out to the surface, they have to go upwards, right? 
to get from this level, whatever is in there, they have to go upwards. Whether it's a straight shaft that they climb up or a spiraling staircase or however, whatever it is that you choose, they need to move upwards. Why? Because this is an organic dungeon. That means it's filled by monsters that have made their homes there, that are living there, not that are waiting there because the master has said, wait here. They are people who are literally waiting to be told. Uh, th sorry, these are not people waiting to be told, attack anything that comes in here. These are creatures that live here and that have made their home here. That means they have to go out and forage. They have to go and look for resources. They have to bring kindling down there to create fires. They have to get fur cloaks, everything along those lines they need to obtain. So that means that now when we go back to our map, and I have no idea what layer my map is on. <laughs> so when we now go back to our map, we now realize we're going to need, and it's in red because it's an addition, we need a forest nearby so the creatures can go hunting. All right, that is a forest see it's got tree trunks and everything all right so we need a forest nearby we need a source of water so that means we need a river duh, 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 duh. and maybe and this is fun the river pours into the mine shaft okay so that solves the water problem because it's actually pouring into the mine shaft and will give us water later on fantastic so they can go hunting in the forest great they can get their water from the water supply, which runs through the marsh. Fantastic. Creatures in almost all fantasy settings, and definitely in science fiction settings, need stuff. Whether it's axes or tools or implements, you name it, they need stuff. Sometimes they'll go raiding for it. Sometimes they will be lucky enough to have adventurers come wandering in with seven pickaxes, 13 brass mugs, five wash basins, 15 towelettes for the bathroom. Oh, yes, and a nice new shaving mirror for dad. Sometimes they'll come in with that, but oftentimes they won't. So what happens in places like that? Well, from my own experience, unfortunately, South Africa has a lot of mines. They have a lot of gold mines. And something that I didn't know until I did a documentary on it, mines get stolen and hijacked by illegal miners. The miners work in almost pitch darkness with non-professional tools, but there is a fortune to be had if you're willing to take it. And so these poor people live for two, three, four weeks in absolute darkness with a little candle or a torch occasionally, mining away at the gold. They don't necessarily have easy access to the surface. They've got to sneak past security and all those kind of wonderful things, as well as trying to get to the surface. So what happens? Well, what happens is there are traders who will take the bare necessities of life and a few luxuries into the mineshaft on a weekly basis. They will journey and risk going into the mineshaft to then find these pirates and trade with them. Now, you'd think that the pirates would just take the money or take the food and not pay for it. They are, after all, criminals. Because they don't want to leave or they can't leave because of security reasons, they pay these traders exorbitant prices, absolutely insane prices for the things that traders bring down and they don't harm the traders because otherwise the traders won't come back. So there is an economy that exists within that space. Once I learned that, my dungeons took on a whole new level. Ha ha ha. They took on a whole new shape. And that shape was this moving, growing economy. How wonderful was it that even if you have a collection of ogres that live on level five, they will still happily trade with the human trader who sneaks down to level five and brings them large pickaxe heads or wooden shafts or arrowheads or chickens or whatever. And they won't kill that trader because he will make and bring back more. <coughs> A bigger pardon. They will give him money, or her, either or, 
because they are enterprising and they're taking advantage of it. That's a very, very long story. I'm sorry to have rambled there. It's a very long story to tell you that we now need to start looking at our economy of life. How are the creatures in this dungeon going to survive? It always vexes me when you watch something like Indiana Jones, as much as I love that movie, how there happen to be real live snakes in the pit that hasn't been accessed for a thousand years. Where did the snakes come from? Who breeds them and replenishes them? Who goes in there and goes, well, we've got to get 20,000 rats to feed all these snakes. It does boggle the mind sometimes, unless you have an economy like this, in which case then that snake trap becomes something that makes sense. There's a group of kobolds that keep the snake pit well oiled and operating because it keeps larger creatures away from their area. It's an economy that has to exist for them to live peacefully. Anyway, I uh, get ahead of myself. So we now realize that we need all of these different things in order for our little communities to survive. So what that now informs us is now when we look at, let's say, for example, the blue layer, when we now look at the blue layer, our first dungeon level, that could very well be something that is... And this is from a, a, a top-down view, if I go over here, all right. We now look at it and we go, great. So we have, and I'm just going to change colors, we have a mine shaft that leads down into this level, okay? Maybe it's a set of stairs that slowly comes down into this space. The mine shaft will, let's say, run out horizontally as well as... Eh, vertically right and we'll have then different shafts coming off of that as they were following the veins of ore that they were looking for and maybe there's caverns that have opened up that allowed them to change course some might be dead ends because they caved in others might go this way into a natural cave system we know we know that this landing zone has to be a circular room because there is a giant waterfall that crashes in here maybe there's a pool but the waterfall doesn't overflow so that means it pours down into the next level okay which is important for us to actually draw on the diagram so i'm going to shift colors here to blue so we've got waterfall because you've got to make the sound effect and the waterfall we know goes to the first level all right and we know that it gets into the second level at the very least at this stage all right and i'm just going to come put it in blue here so we know that it, it corresponds okay so this area you draw out as you need to However, there's an important thing to consider. If you are a goblin horde and you don't control the entire zone, the entire level, you have to get from home. Wow, that's home, trust me, not how. Eh? You have to get from home along here, down this shaft, up to these stairs, and then up the, 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 the exit way. However, you've got goblin tribe D here, or you've got a pack of wolves or whatever wolves you see you've got wolves they're very similar to wolves but they've, they've got big long teeth they're like walruses so anyway so you've got wolves here that makes for an interesting encounter as far as adventurers go but as far as the economy and the ecology of the space that doesn't make sense it really doesn't make sense so what do you do do you just not have wolves do you give up and say well the cobbles are everything no what you do is you realize that the wolves have got this way around. The goblins have piled up sticks here to keep the wolves from getting in. And more importantly, there is a big barricade here. Right. And a stone which the goblins can move over that entrance when they want to. Now look at the scene. The PCs walk down into this rather square-shaped mine shaft. The stairs continue downward, but from here you can see that the shafts have extended to the north, the east, and the south. However, the ones to the east 
have a spiked wooden barricade that's got deer antlers entwined in it, as well as scraps of old leather. And every now and again, you can see tufts of white fur, which on closer examination is wolf fur. There are obviously goblins behind the barricades and they will now attack the players. Once the players have dispatched those goblins, they'll then look to the north shaft. There's a large heavy stone which looks like it frequently gets rolled over that entranceway. You're not entirely sure why. The players hopefully will go into panic mode and think that they're going to get trapped inside. No, the reason why that large stone is there is because when the goblins want to go out or come back in again, they roll that stone over the entrance, keeping the wolves inside, and then they can move in and out quite freely. However, the goblins return the stone to its original position with perhaps offerings of meat to the wolves. Why? Because the wolves' presence, the smell of the wolves, will keep larger predators away. And should something come down and attack the wolves, well, the goblins haven't lost either way, have they? The wolves have taken care of the problem. So this is what I talk about when I talk about the ecology. Oh, uh, sorry, the PC is warning me of things. This is what I talk about when I talk about the ecology of the dungeon. It is this idea of slowly building a narrative. What lives here? Why does it live here? And how does it coexist with the others? What's the important thing? And so slowly what you do is you work your way down each level, looking at how each level has evolved, has grown into different things. Maybe one of the levels is completely flooded with water. And you have to ask the question, well, how do the other levels get out? How do they move out? This is a cool adventure level, which is filled with water traps and the players, characters having to swim underwater for a long time, holding their breath, all those wonderfully dramatic traps that you can add to your dungeon. How do we get from mineshaft level six to mineshaft level five or level four in this case? Those are questions which you have to answer, but you also have to answer it for the monsters themselves. Is there a trapped realm of ogres? who can't get above that water level. And so there's a trader who has a small diving bell. This allows the players to interact with the trader, get information from the trader, trade with the trader, and know that if they go below, if they go underneath, there is someone who is just a level up, who's selling health potions, who's selling food, who's selling extra weapons, and who knows their way in and out of the dungeon. They only meet their trader once they are halfway through the dungeon and their supplies are almost exhausted. There's nothing worse than having your players get halfway down the dungeon, realize they haven't prepared enough, go back out of the dungeon, because then you're faced with the question of, well, they went back to town and they spent a week in town. Now what's repopulated that dungeon? Do you just flash forward in a montage of them going back down into the dungeon? Or do you start to fight through all those levels again? It's very, very tedious either way. So rather have something that they can go to halfway. Yes, it's a little bit computer gamery to have this trader in the middle of the dungeon. But in real life, that's what happens. So why not then transfer it into um, fantasy or science fiction? It makes perfect sense to me. So you then work through each of the levels, asking yourself the same story all the time. Now, of course, if it is a dungeon where the creatures are being paid to stay there, that's a different story. They'll have different orders and they will respond differently. When an alarm is set off on level one, creatures on level three should be sent up to check what's going on. And if you were really a big master megamind, your level one would be the most terrifyingly dangerous place on Earth and levels three to seven or eight or nine would be fairly empty. That's a different way of looking at it, and we can go into that in another video if you'd like. Anyway, so this is how I design multi-level dungeons, doing the actual floor layout and that kind of stuff. There's videos on the channel on how to do that. Again, though, if you want me to go through a complete dungeon design that takes several hours to go through, I'm happy to do that. This is obviously for you. So this weekend, I hope that you take your players on a multi-level dungeon that blows them away because it feels like a complete, well-thought-out, real space to explore in and to fight through and to change the dynamic. What if the gremlins on level two never liked the kobolds on level one? And so instead of attacking the party, they celebrate the party when the party arrives. That would be something different. Anyway... Until next time, I wish you and yours the very happiest 
of playing. 